So colleagues, um, good morning and good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is Man Suon Yai. I'm the head of inclusive growth at UNDP. And it is my pleasure to deliver these introductory remarks in this session on beyond recovery towards 2030 as recommendations to address inequality. You would agree with me that this meeting comes at a pivotal moment, um, a time of unprecedented challenges. For the first time since 1990, global human development is going backwards, the impact of the pandemic. Inequalities in human development, beyond income alone, and with their adverse impact on the quality of life had become visible even before the pandemic. What we're seeing now is that the COVID-19 has amplified pre-existing vulnerabilities and export fault line, notably around income, gender, education-related inequalities. And other inequalities are also being let bare, most notably access to the COVID-19 vaccine. LDCs, which represent approximately 14% of the world's population, had access to just 1.6% of the vaccine doses administered worldwide. LDCs have also been the hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis that is unfortunately reversing years of steady progress on poverty reduction. In a recent study um, of 107 countries, UNDP projects that multidimensional poverty, which of course goes beyond the income, um, is to increase by three percentage points on average across LDCs. So colleagues, this is an urgent need um, for, for bold collective and coordinated action by countries and the international community in solidarity, to correct course and build forward better with the SDG side. Against this background, we are pleased to share today the findings of a new research paper developed in partnership with the World Inequality Lab on the social economic inequality impacts of the COVID-19 crisis within and across countries and on the policy responses designed to mitigate them. This presentation will be delivered by Mr. Tancred Watiwes, uh, who's a senior research fellow with the World Inequality Lab. Tancred, I will welcome to you. We are hopeful that our deliberations will contribute to shape the program of action for the LDCs for the next decade that will be adopted in 2022 in Doha, Qatar. To do so, we have today a panel of distinguished speakers that will be introduced by the moderator, Mr. Swanem Wagle, who is the senior team leader for strategy, policy, and partnership at the UNDP Regional Bureau for Asian Pacific. Swanem has worked as an international development professional for more than 20 years, including as senior economist at the World Bank, at UNDP offices in Hanoi, Colombo, and New York, and for the National Planning Commission of the Government of Nepal. He co-authored the 2013 Global Human Development Report titled The Rise of the South. He also chairs the Institute for Integrated Development Studies in Kathmandu and has advised several nonprofit institutions and forums across South Asia. Before giving the floor to the World Inequality Lab, allow me to recognize the presence of His Excellencies, Ambassadors Brooks Ligoya, and from the representative from Malawi, Ambassador Wong, welcome to you and also Ambassador Mohamed Bande, um, our diplomat representative from Nigeria. With this um, being said, dear Tancred, I'm gonna um, give you the floor now for your presentation. We have 10 minutes for that. Thanks so much. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mansoor, and uh, good morning slash afternoon to you all. Um, so I'm Tancred Voiturier, which is a, a long impossible French name, even for French people. And the usual joke is that voiturier means sparking valet. Uh, so it's an humble name and I will have a, a humble stance in this conversation. So I'll try to upload uh, the presentation uh, for the ease of all this. Try to check whether we can move right or left. Uh, okay. Uh, so it seems to work. Can you see it and can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we'll switch off my video because I'm on the 4G talking from uh, Abidjan in Ivory Coast. 
So uh, thanks again uh, for the invite. It's, uh, I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to attend this timely event on a super important topic and uh, happy to, to share also with you a few insights from a work in progress research on the inequality impact of COVID and of policy responses. I will focus on the, the main uh, messages uh, from a, a brief that we, uh, we, we wrote with a colleague and friend, Lucas Chancel from the World Inequality Lab and shared insight uh, uh, from this brief, which benefited from substantial inputs and ideas from the UNDP Inclusive Growth Team. Uh, I would like to thank her warmly here. The question and uh, objectives uh, we had in mind were the following, basically to get a better sense of inequality impact, not only of COVID, but also of policy responses to start with. In a more prospective view, uh, what could be learned should new shocks occur in the, in the future? And in terms of policy recommendations, the idea was to spark a conversation on what is specific here. I mean, what are the specific recommendations for LDCs in this period? Recommendations that we could not have laid down, say, four years ago, uh, for instance. I will start with a, a bit of a, of a context. Uh, to start with, with uh, domestic income inequality pretty much higher than previous estimates suggested. Uh, new data from the World Inequality Database uh, shows that in Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, inequality levels reach record high in dark red here uh, in many countries beyond the usual suspect case of uh, South Africa. And if we keep the assumption of a magnifying effect of COVID on income inequality, uh, this is uh, sobering, uh, sobering news. As regards uh, the health system, general government health expenditures as a share of GDP on the right hand side shrunk in low-income countries between the pre-financial crisis, 2006-08, uh, until the pre-COVID crisis 10 years later. Uh, and the move was the opposite in OECD countries and middle-income middle countries. The financial crisis, 2008-09, amplified the long-run divergence between rich and poor countries with a ratio up, of up to eight, uh, we can see on the, on the left-hand side. If now we look at out-of-pocket out of pocket health spending, they increased in low-income uh, countries to compensate for the decline in public expenditures in relation to GDP on the left-hand side with an interesting and warning figure uh, if we think about uh, India tragedy now of middle-income countries where the ratio is even below a low-income countries ratio. And on the right hand side, uh, well known figures, uh, well known figures here, public finance followed diverging path. Uh, low income countries government revenues remain twice as low as high income countries government revenues at around 90%, even though they uh, experience, these countries experience a significant growth over the last 10 years or so. So, what are our main uh, uh, findings. Um, first, many authorities um, uh, considered that the best option was to prevent the spread of the virus and implement low-tech mitigation measures, temperature control, hand washing, social distancing, uh, with the voluntary support from the population which adhered to such measures after epidemic or pandemic outbreaks in the past in their region. The, the focus on prevention and the swift decision to lock down in poor countries can be explained uh, obviously by the limited capacity of many of these countries to cope with the sanitary consequences of COVID. And I'm sure we'll have uh, much uh, discussions over this. Further, the capacity to provide economic support was highly correlated to country income level. And in MIC and LIC, it was both slower and smaller. 
Interestingly enough, uh, there are success stories and uh, countries standing out with a mix of different approaches, including community consultations, social mobilization, solidarity across and within social, religious and business groups with as well prevention of stigmatization, transparency, communication, and uh, I would say a wall of government approach. The landmark achievement here is a case of Rwanda, uh, which supported this quote uh, from Agnes Binaguao, one of the architects of Rwanda's health system, as you can read, COVID has shown that the Western world and the global north are not the best at doing everything. Second, uh, policy responses, however, have amplified pre-COVID, I would say, policy inequalities across countries. And this is true at the macro level. If we look at the borrowing capacities and the spread of yields on treasury bonds we have now, and it's true also at sectoral level uh, with social protection and liberal policies being a, a case in point. Financial support was limited in LICs and MICs vis-a-vis -vis high income countries and uh, labor market policy responses transferred in many circumstances, a large chunk of the impact to the workers. This for policy inequalities on policy inequalities on the ground, I would say we find mounting evidence in the literature review we've done uh, uh, of various forms of inequalities, which seem to be exacerbated by COVID. This is still work in progress, however, uh, as we have more data in OECD countries than we have for developing countries, and in particular uh, for LDCs. Fourth, if we look forward, um, inequalities are looming, uh, as uh, history and, and history records shows, um, because history shows that actually economic crisis amplify economic inequalities, and this has been a constant feature of uh, the, 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 the crisis after World War II, including, sorry, including as well the 1929 crisis. Fifth, and last but not least, uh, not only all the inequalities could widen, but new inequality, inequality could arise in the form of a a lower capacity to, to, to have countries engaging in an inclusive and green, green transition. So the burning question is, so what and what's, what's next? So now we know that we have and we're facing a, a high risk of looming of, of larger inequalities, all the new, what can be done to start with, and it's really a point we focus on, maybe it's a trick on an obsession of the word uh, in, uh, in the quality uh, lab, which is really uh, uh, focusing on data, data collection, data cooking, and so on. But I think the, 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 this, this motto is correct, meaning what, what can be measured can be fixed. So we need a compass for policies, uh, and inequalities are to be more systematically used as a compass, which is not the case because of lack of data, and, and lack of awareness as well on how inequalities play out and hamper growth and resilience. Second, uh, we have tax divide, which, which is widening. And we're used to having the haves and the haves not. We actually ha also have the haves tax system and the haves not a tax system uh, uh, well functioning. And, and there are options to bridge this gap between the haves a tax system and the haves not a tax system with corporate tax, wealth tax, and stock tax registry to start with. And we have, we know cases and programs from donors uh, uh, in, this, in this area. So I would say here, the agenda is set and we could think about as well, the Addis Ababa and tax initiative. The issue now is to be more focused on, on the means. Uh, third, there's a need for burden sharing in recovery measures. Uh, growth resumption is closely linked to the capacity to access to vaccines. And there is a need here for advocacy and campaigning to shift in a way policymaker a rather conservative stance when it comes to IPR and, and make this stance closer to public opinions, which seems to be ready for such a transfer of uh, tech uh, uh, property rights. Fourth, uh, I mentioned the have and the have not, 
tax capacity. It's true as well. I mean, this device superimposes on the haves and the haves not the capacity to plan, to steer, to monitor the shift toward a low carbon and inclusive economy. We have trillions for the green economy recovery. The Green Deal is true for the US uh, with this commitment to net zero target. We have in Europe a carbon border adjustment measure and, and, and legislative package which will be put on the table uh, this July. So there are an intended consequences of these green recovery measures in the global north on the global south with possible adverse effects, which have to be considered. And in relation to that, if we think about this carbon border adjustment measure, which will be set up by the EU, the issue on the use of the proceed of this carbon border adjustment measure and the, the ways and means to, to use it as a, as an option to increase the capacity of the thousand to get an age in the upcoming green economy is something we should debate quite promptly now. Fifth, in the more agenda setting mode, I would say uh, inequality and environmental protection are uh, two intertwined uh, uh, challenges. And this calls for a reform of the welfare state and a move toward an ecological welfare state, I would say, taxing more pollution and capital than labor and providing green goods and social protection within, uh, let's say, call it a, a modernized social contract. And I'm always puzzled when I read the SDG index scorecard of the uh, Sustainable Development Solution Network, SDSN, with Scandinavian countries ranking first year after year. I mean, we cannot all be Swedes. Uh, uh, yet the, the emergence of a green welfare state or regime in poor countries is of utmost emergency, but it's more an agenda setting point here in the guise of uh, policy recommendation. And I will conclude here. Thank you in advance uh, for uh, your, your contribution and eager to listen to you. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Tancred, uh, for that uh, clear and uh, very useful policy oriented uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Swarnim Wagle, and I've been introduced by Mansoor. I'm happy to moderate this uh, very distinguished uh, panel uh, discussion uh, today. Uh, let me just make a few set of uh, introductory remarks before I uh, go to the panel. I think the three major takeaways for me from this presentation is uh, basically that uh, you know we already started from a pretty unequal position before the pandemic, uh, the data that uh, the lab uh, shared with us is speaks for itself. And, uh, and with the pandemic, I think the issues of the missing medal, the, the digital divide got accentuated, you know, this erosion of social capital, all contributing and perhaps seeding uh, a perpetuation of intergenerational inequality uh, in rich countries and poor countries alike. I think that's, that's uh, very much uh, uh, the writing on the wall. I think that's an important uh, message there. The second takeaway for me was, uh, as we talk about income and wealth and even consumption inequality, you know, uh, some of the policy prescriptions are on equalizing investments at early stages of, uh, of, uh, of the life cycle, right? And this is where issues of health, education, uh, learning, nutrition, social protection, and all these issues have been receiving uh, great uh, policy attention, impetus even. Um, but it is in this regard that the health data, the health, uh, health numbers uh, as a share of GDP, the expenditures, and the contrast between the rich and the poor countries was, uh, was quite striking in that there's been a neglect of the public health system uh, across the developing world. And this is something that we need to redress. Um, the, the, the third takeaway for me was that, so COVID is you know, this big rupture. And this is a watershed moment for all of us to take stock of where we stand regarding the development pathways. How do we reorient them? How do we reimagine uh, some of these uh, uh, schemes? How do we revamp things that are broken? So the old policies, institutions, pathways, I think this is per the perfect time uh, to uh, really uh, take a fresh look uh, at, at this. And on the new agenda for research, uh, there's there's a lot to unpack within countries in terms of inequality, but also across countries, trends on, um, on uh, wealth uh, inequality, income inequality, consumption inequality, uh, different measures, uh, the genies and the Palmar issues we're familiar with, but there are now new attempts to even 
take account. The HDI that the UNDP champions is also uh, very much uh, now you know, used to track inequality by sort of penalizing countries uh, for, in terms of um, uh, the human development achievements. So there's a lot there. And these new secular trends on, uh, on the whole motions of capitalism, you know, the, the, the relative weakening power of labor versus capital, uh, Branko Milanovic, uh, Toma Piketty, all you know have contributed a lot on this, and I see in the audience distinguished professors Kosik Basu, Stefan Durkan, uh, who have worked and you know have been talking about many of these issues uh, for a while now. The share of the owners of capital, for example, has uh, has increased in the rich world. We need to know much more uh, of what the trend is like in the developing world, uh, and this is where the emerging new research and, and the emphasis on data and evidence that the presentation made is also very much uh, welcome. But these new concepts that Branco has uh, floated, for example, on how uh, homo brutia, you know, the owners of uh, the dividends from labor and capital being the same group, and thus if you track from the 70s and the 80s onwards, uh, it's very much uh, this new class that has emerged. The homogamy, another term on assortative mating, how that has perpetuated unequal intergenerational inequalities. These are all issues that, we, that have been well documented uh, for the rich countries, but I think we need to do much more uh, in the low income and the LDCs uh, going forward. And the plea really is that the old toolkit of redistribution, um, even revolutions, tax and transfer kind of, uh, the, the old toolkit that we had, the conventional measures to tackle uh, inequality uh, could be hitting uh, diminishing returns. You know, uh, Are there limits to mass education after 15 years of education? Do we hit a you know the cognitive sort of a wall where any additional increment will not uh, you know reduce inequalities? Taxation we said we should tax and spend, but taxation is unpopular. You know there are all these political economy choices that that come uh, with it. So I think uh, so. There's this whole agenda for research, but the the issues that um, that the report this study emphasizes on. Um, the need for new data on income and wealth, that's very much welcome. Reimagining public finance, uh, that's that's very much uh, welcome. And this dovetails well with this plea, which I liked, it was this ecological welfare state or the eco state as the report calls it. Uh, you know, How do we build in uh, social protection schemes uh, as part of new expenditures? And how do we, you know, the, not just greening the recovery, but also the eventual uh, so the longer term, medium term development pathways leading up to the SDGs and beyond, but how this is not just a national project, right? These have to be paired with the international uh, uh, provisioning of global public goods. And this is where I think Mansoor started with that stark uh, number on vaccine inequities. You know, 84% uh, uh, of the doses have gone uh, to the rich countries and the upper middle income countries and the low income countries have just received 0.3% of the 1.7 billion doses that have been administered uh, until yesterday. So this is, you know, these inequities demand a more effective provisioning of regional and global public goods. But, and this has to be paired with the whole uh, state capacity and capability issues. I'll come to some of the other lessons um, from the pandemic that is still evolving, that is still unfolding. Uh, uh, maybe uh, in the course of the discussion, but let me now, with those remarks, open the floor, or uh, I'd rather go to the panelists. And um, I would uh, start uh, with uh, His Excellency Ambassador Perks Ligoya. Uh, we're very uh, honored to have him uh, here. He's the permanent representative of Malawi to the United Nations, and he also chairs the LDC group uh, at the United Nations. He's a macroeconomist a very distinguished economist who has been the governor of the Reserve Bank of Malawi and also a senior economist uh, at the IMF. Um, His Excellency has a long career in diplomacy, including serving as the permanent representative to UNEP and UN Habitat. He's also served as the chairman of the board for the Malawi Enterprise uh, Development Fund and chairman of the board of directors for the Electricity Supply Commission uh, of uh, Malawi. Uh, we are very keen to hear from you, sir, on uh, the focus areas uh, in the program of action, uh, you know, as we discuss the fifth uh, LDC conference. So as the chair of the LDC's group, very keen to hear on how we're gonna put some of these issues, these raising issues on poverty, inequality, the whole unfinished agenda related to the LDCs um, in, 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 in the new uh, program of action. So uh, with that, uh, let me hand over the floor to you, uh, Ambassador Ligoya. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Swanim. And uh, thanks very much to Tancred uh, for the presentation. 
and uh, my good friend Masu uh, for uh, this occasion. Uh, we, we are living in a period that I believe we will remember uh, for the rest of our lives because 50 years after the creation of the LDC group, you have told us that uh, the statistics are going the wrong way. We have more poor people, we have more hungry people, and inequality has been amplified. It was said during the presentation, every crisis amplifies inequalities. And when we take the 2008 one, did that, and now there is more of that. And the inequalities are not only between countries, but uh, even uh, within, we have seen that uh, the income inequalities in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, other parts of the world are, are increasing. Now, we said when we were adopting the SDGs that we want to leave no one behind. I think we should uh, be frank with ourselves and say that as at now, we are leaving people behind. And the people we are leaving are mostly in LDCs and other vulnerable countries. So let me start by thanking UNDP for, for this study that uh, uh, you have presented to us. It has very interesting uh, results, but gives us food for thought in going forward, preparing for the LDC-5, because we have to find solutions. LDC-5, a 10-year program that we are going to end up with, program of action, is going to coincide with the end of the 2030 agenda. Are we going to get there? And the more than the problems we had before the pandemic, we see now that we, first of all, have to recover from the pandemic uh, and then think about uh, how we uh, recover better and uh, uh, aspire to get to the 2030 agenda successfully. More than a year now, since the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we see the effectiveness of vaccines in protecting people against the virus. However, the vaccines are distributed unevenly among the countries. That's a big inequality we are talking about. With only 16% of the global population, people in uh, high income nations have procured, we have heard, almost 84% of, of, of the vaccines with only 0.3% uh, of vaccine doses uh, to our uh, part of the, of the world. And uh, LDCs need 1.3 billion doses of vaccines and we need immediate access uh, to that at a zero cost. Priority number one is therefore to end this inequality in the access to vaccines. Financing of the COVAX facility, declaring vaccines as a global public good and ensuring the delivery of the vaccines are actions that the international community uh, need to look at as we prepare uh, this program of action. Second, as I said earlier on, the recovery. And uh, we see that the health, social and economic consequences of the 
pandemic have devastated the LDCs more because of their lack of capacity and uh, vulnerabilities. The LDC5 process will have to come up with policy strategies that will bring about equitable and green recovery uh, and build back better. At Oxfam reports that from March 18 to the end of 2020, global billionaire wealth increased by 3.9 trillion. By contrast, global workers combined earnings fell by 3.7 trillion. So globally, what the uh, workers have lost have been uh, more than captured uh, by a, a handful of global billionaires. Uh, and this says nothing else but that inequality has been uh, amplified. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced many workers into remote and telework as offices have closed around the country. This we know. But the people in LDCs could not work from home or not having internet connections uh, and logistics, thereby losing completely their jobs and earnings for their families. The COVID-19 pandemic has also exacerbated longstanding gender inequalities. Women are more likely than men to work in service occupations that require face-to-face -face, uh, interactions and have been hard hit by layoffs because of the nature of these jobs, teleworking is not an option uh, for many women. Therefore, one of the biggest impacts of the COVID-19 is acceleration and deepening of pre-pandemic trends of growing inequalities between rich and poor. One of the key guiding principles of the next program of action for LDCs is to accelerate uh, inclusive economic growth and address this whole problem of inequalities. In promoting equality, we need to reflect both on equalities within and among countries, inequalities between men and women, rural and urban population, we also need to set a target on full and productive employment and decent work for all and empower the marginalized groups of our societies by integrating them into production, distribution, and value chain network. With a view to addressing inequalities at the global level, we need to address the challenges related to global systemic issues. LDCs were expected to grow at a minimum of 6% of GDP per year in order to uh, reduce um, uh, inequalities uh, uh, and achieve SDG goals. However, we know that it is now evident that only a few countries are achieving that bringing uh, the inequalities even more pronounced even between the LDCs themselves. LDC5 is proposing the enhancement of productive capacities of LDCs as a major policy recommendation to end existing inequalities between the developed and the developing countries. Guided by these principles, we have identified six key priority areas for LDCs in the next program of action which are as follows, investing in people. And this has a lot to do with education, health, and other social services. Secondly, leveraging the power of science, technology, and innovation. And in this, we see another uh, uh, inequality, which is the digital divide which is growing and uh, we have to have policies to arrest this inequality. The work on digital finance by UNDP and others and uh, the implementation of the SG's roadmap on digital cooperation 
is work that is very important and will have to feed into the LDC-5 policy guidance. Third, structural transformation. And fourth, enhancing international trade. It is sad that uh, the LDCs with a target set in uh, Istanbul Program of Action to achieve at least 2% of uh, world exports, we, we are uh, even uh, failing to get uh, to 1% of uh, global exports. And uh, the pandemic has just made it even worse. Fifth, supporting our climate and ensuring a resilient recovery from COVID-19. And lastly, mobilizing international solidarity uh, and reinvigorated global partnership. Uh, let me hasten to mention that uh, there are uh, signs of hope uh, from uh, the international community because now they realize, uh, everybody realizes that we need to do something. Otherwise, this leaving no one behind just becomes a song and we are not uh, going to achieve our 23rd agenda if we take life as normal. In bringing transformative change and structural transformation, access to finance and technology is fundamental. And I'm very happy with the work that we are doing with you, uh, UNCDF, UNDP, uh, in uh, financing, innovative methods of financing. We need to substantially increase our tax uh, GDP ratio, and it has been mentioned in the presentation. Uh, this is not popular, and uh, but governments will have uh, to do it, and uh, it brings into question what has been called the new ecological welfare state. Let's discuss it. Let's discuss it. ODA is far from historical target of 0.15 to 0.20% of GNI. We need to scale up this target to 0.25% or at least half of ODA should go to LDCs. Only 6% of uh, blended finance is going to LDCs. There is a tendency for investors to shun uh, the LDCs because of the perception of uh, increased risks or high risks in LDCs. This is a myth because it's not always true that um, all investments in LDCs are, are, are highly risky. We need to reverse this. And uh, you saw the, the report of UNCTAD telling us that uh, of a 40% drop in, uh, in, in investment in our countries. Very worrisome. We need to discuss this in the LDC-5 uh, dialogue. The SDG target on the investment promotion regime has not seen any progress at all. And we need to have a master plan to deliver on this target. The issue of debt is a major challenge as half of our countries are in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. We have already requested the SG to constitute a high level panel of experts on the debt crisis of LDCs to make recommendations on how to address uh, the crisis. We welcome uh, some of the measures being taken, be it by the uh, G7, G20, the IMF, World Bank, but these uh, are not sufficient. We need more. And by the way, uh, we need uh, debt forgiveness and not just delaying the dates 
uh, or for paying, uh, 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 repaying the day. By the way, uh, the, the DSSI assumes that uh, uh, by the end of 2021, countries, our countries will be now able to start repaying the loan. This, this is not realistic because the consequences of the COVID are going to be with us for some time. And uh, I believe that come even 2022, we will still be struggling. Uh, and you have seen in the presentation that the health sector, it was said was somehow neglected. This is not just a mere neglect, it's because of the limited physical space in our countries. Now, if you have to use your money to repay uh, external debt and other exigencies that are coming up, uh, you would have, you would end up spending uh, less money in the end on, on important uh, social sectors such as health. Ambassador Ligoya, may I ask you to wrap up, please? Yes, I'm finishing. It is difficult, of course. I was going to mention that uh, all, uh, uh, I can't mention all areas, but I hope I have given you a glimpse of uh, our expectation. And uh, let me end by inviting you all to participate in LDC5 in Doha, Qatar from 24 to 27th January, 2022 and its preparatory works leading up to the Doha 22. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ligoya. That was a very rich uh, presentation. I'm sorry, I have to cut you off, but uh, uh, you gave a big uh, uh, list of issues that have plagued LDCs for the last 50 years that remain an unfinished uh, agenda in this, uh, in this field. But after COVID uh, and coming out of the pandemic, I think many of these have become even more uh, important. So investment in people, the digital cooperation, structural transformation, which is actually the 2011 sort of signature theme of the Istanbul uh, conference, international trade and investment, climate, and of course, international solidarity. Those six um, point agenda that we've uh, sort of put on the table uh, for the fifth um, LDC conference would uh, definitely be deserve uh, sort of detailed uh, homework and, and, and uh, and exercise uh, on the part of all stakeholders. So thank you very much for putting those that rich agenda on the table. Uh, may I now uh, invite uh, His Excellency Ambassador Pizzani Mohammed Bande, uh, who is the permanent representative of uh, Nigeria to the United Nations. And he also co-chairs the Alliance for Poverty Eradication. Um, Ambassador Mohammed Bande served as the president of the 74th session of the United Nations uh, General Assembly and uh, among many topics uh, that he championed uh, during his chairmanship includes poverty eradication, zero hunger, quality education, and of course, uh, climate uh, action. So over to you, Ambassador. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator. And uh, I'm glad to see distinguished colleagues. I've seen my brother, Parks doing extremely well alongside others. And uh, I think let me say that the context has been really pretty laid out for us. Even before the pandemic, countries, especially LDCs, were struggling. And I think the point initially uh, toward the end that uh, Pax was making, I think is well, uh, well taken. I therefore will avoid repeating those other than to say that following from what has been stated by the uh, two previous speakers, actually, the context has been read clear and the urgency to do something, especially now that uh, the pandemic has been with us beyond even IR. Nobody expected that it was going to take this long, but progress is being made, but there are difficulties. I think uh, I will just reflect on the issue concerning, first of all, it's good that we are doing this as we pray for, for the big meeting. And uh, I think uh, all I will do is to simply say, from the standpoint of Nigeria and partly of the region within which Nigeria is located, the issues of inequalities are critical and inequities beyond the global, even the regional and the national as well. What are the elements or spaces around this inequality? One is regional. Within countries, some fare better than others. 
for a host of reasons which we need to examine in order to resolve. Two, we can deal with inequities relating to gender. I think both previous speakers have raised this. I think it's well understood. Rural and urban are, of course, spaces of difference that have hampered development and growth in Nigeria and I will say in the sub-region. The same issue relating to uh, uh, generational inequities. Uh, and some of the generational inequities are glaring in terms of unemployment or underemployment that has in many cases fueled the conflict that we have seen not only in, in, in the region of the lectured region, but also in other parts of the continent. Uh, next is the question of an issue that uh, economists talk about, and it is critical, formal and informal. The inequities relating to privileges or uh, distortions of what economic activity looks like in the official figures, good or bad, relating to formality or informality, I think is something that African economists and political economists as well have debated. And I think we need to, again, pay attention to, the, to reduce informality for reasons that I think are clear in all discussions. Next is the issue, I think, relating to technology. And I'm very glad that uh, this new technology has prefigured before the pandemic, but its implications for health and well being have been laid bare in the absence from school of millions of children in Africa and in the sub region that I speak of, i.e., digital, digital inequality has made it impossible for some countries, for some communities, to have even a semblance of continuing education. This is a serious matter that has implications for health and development, as well as for peace in our region. There is therefore the whole question, what, what can we do to begin to address, and who do we turn to to address inequalities between men and women, rural and urban, young and old, formal, informal, regional, and, and, and in terms of technology, access to and utilization of. I would say that broadly we can deal with the policies that come in terms of what, who to engage. Obviously government is key in terms of policies that really are fair, broad, and also targeted to groups or processes that are required. Uh, and in this issue of policies, we must be sure that women ministries or youth and women ministries, however they are, they, are, they are called, and NGOs that have worked in the fields where excluded groups have suffered the most must be there so that they will say this will work, this will not work for ABCD and their buy-in is key so that there is an understandable connection and sustainability. Sustainability test is key in relation to knowledge of people who are impacted, who are likely to be impacted, who have also shown an interest in the subject at hand. This is, is important. Next is the question, and I'm glad that uh, two speakers have raised it, of data. Its quality, its breadth, and its meaning. And it's not just we dis disaggregate, we disaggregate for what purposes. Let us be clear as to this. Let us also know the meaning of what it is that we are, we are talking about. This is important in measuring, measurement of things like welfare. What does it look like in particular communities, in particular countries, in particular periods of history? This is extremely relevant in the discussion concerning sustainability and the whole question of building back better, which is a key element in this conversation as it relates to LDCs post-COVID. Um, the issue is also beyond data, we need to deal with beyond government, 
what policies are there relating to financial institutions? Because they impact what happens or doesn't happen in any political economy. Who learns to whom, under what conditions? Are these policies fair? Are there monitoring of loans and in investment support to small groups, not necessarily uh, big companies, but everyone who can produce something is given something to support that production or distribution, whatever the economic activity is. Next is the question, and this is really key. In relation to Nigeria, for example, and we, we know this of the continent, uh, the borders are what they are. So therefore, uh, if we have a policy that is targeted only about Nigeria, and which is fine, but then it ignores looking over its shoulder to see how far is Nigeria Republic doing? How is Chad doing? How is Cameroon doing? How is the Republic doing? How is Togo doing? These are, these are countries that we are intimately, intimately connected to and their well-being is important and has implications for us, just as the well-being of countries farther down across the continent are important. And in this, I'm very glad that uh, ECOWAS as ECOWAS has very important processes to begin to harmonize as much as possible policies in relation to certain areas. And I think uh, beyond ECOWAS, such organizations like uh, the Lecture Commission also brings people beyond ECOWAS, including Central Africa and the AU itself. So I think th this, this, these are important and therefore, when we deal with this, we, we deal with partnerships. These partnerships can be sub-regional, can be regional, and now global. Now it is the age of global partnerships, especially in relation to turning the corner on the issue of the moment, which is, the, which is vaccines and vaccination first. Uh, what we have now is a start. It is inadequate. It is slow, and let there be ramping up not only a production of vaccines, but certain assurances that nobody will be waiting until death of, of a community. And this is urgent for all of us as science and technology continue to develop. And relating to science and technology, again, we must guarantee connectivity and access to the world through ICT and using technology in many facets of, of social life. This is key to sustainability post COVID. I will stop here and uh, say, I thank you uh, for inviting me to participate in this very important conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Muhammad Bande. I mean, you, uh, touched on different facets, dimensions of inequality within Nigeria, but also across the continent. And uh, very glad you also touched on uh, all your LDC neighbors, uh, the shared fate that we all, um, you know, um, have to confront. Chad, Niger, Benin are all Nigeria's uh, neighbors, and our, they're all LDCs as well. And and you ended with the plea for uh, more effective partnerships, and this brings us. To our third uh, panelist, Ms. Uh, Rosemary uh, Kalapurakal, who is the Deputy Director at the UN uh, Development Coordination Office. She has over 20 years of experience at the UN, uh, including as the 2030 Agenda uh, Lead Advisor for UNDP. Um, and she's also uh, served uh, at the United Nations Volunteers UNV program as the Deputy Executive Coordinator. So uh, looking uh, forward to hearing from you, uh, Rosemary, on, on the very issues of partnerships, international efforts, you know, joint efforts that can be, that the international community can marshal to tackle some of the issues that we're discussing today. Maybe five to six minutes, if you could wrap it up, that would be great. Thank you. I'll do my best. Uh, thank you, uh, Swarnim, and thank you, uh, UNDP colleagues and others for inviting me to join you in this very distinguished panel. <clears throat> Ambassador Ligoya said, you know, 50 years after the creation of the LDC group, the stats are going the wrong way. 
Another way of seeing it would be that 75 years after the UN was created, the stats are going the wrong way. My day job is to think about how the UN can deliver more effectively to support all countries achieve the SDGs, which represented, let's admit it, a soaring vision of human progress that works for all with a commitment to leaving no one behind. Six years later, we see that the pandemic has brutally shaken that vision, setting human development and poverty, the poverty eradication agenda back by decades. Um, uh, uh, two weeks ago, the WHO DG special envoys on COVID emphasized that future generations prospects have plummeted and that loss of momentum towards the SDGs will have far reaching costs, most of which will be felt by the most vulnerable. <clears throat> Simply put, COVID made everything worse. For LDCs where the progress towards poverty eradication had remained sluggish due to the country's heightened structural vulnerabilities, uh, especially to exogenous shocks, the fallout from COVID can completely wipe out advances made since 2015. So in short, this global crisis is about, is eroding the very concept of sustainability to which the global community committed itself. But if anything is clear, it's that this agenda is more relevant and urgent than ever before of the underpinning premise that countries must grow and prosper economically together, but that for these advances to be sustained in the face of a volatile context and its fruits to be enjoyed by all people, the model of economic growth needs to be fundamentally transformed into one that works for all people, for all countries and protects the planet. We're talking about the pandemic today. But heaven forbid what lies around the corner, what shock, sometimes exogenous, sometimes directly caused by our very models of economic development. This means that now we have to help LDCs and the poorest populations within them with the unfinished MDG agenda, addressing intra-country inequalities as well, bringing to the table people those who for reasons of geography, gender, caste, religion, ethnic grouping, age, disability, type of work performed, never get counted, never get invested in, never got the minimum levels of basic income, health and education required for human dignity. We do know the needed policy measures. SDG push uh, that UNDP has articulated sums it up very nicely. The HDR's enhanced capabilities approach are in, uh, is also quite critical because it envisions frontiers, everyone benefiting from the frontiers in health and longevity, knowledge and technology needed to uh, prosper in a 21st century economy. And last week, DESA uh, published the World Social Report, which posited the need for renewed attention to spatial inequalities, thinking about rural development with a twist, in situ urbanization, which envisions rural populations being able to use new digital technologies to consider to do traditionally urban jobs based in rural areas. And can we end the rural urban divide, they asked, without the rural poor having to migrate to urban areas? Would you consider this naivete? Or is this the kind of ambition that member states asked us for when they signed up to the 2030 agenda? It's clearly not just about what the solutions are, it's about how they are formulated, advocated and implemented. And this cannot happen when people don't trust policies or policymakers, when they don't trust science, as we've seen in country after country. So as the UN, we need to help connect the public policy discourse, not just across economics, but with political economy, sociology and human rights so that we can advance integrated multidimensional approaches that address new frontiers in data and measurement to identify, target and measure inclusion or lack thereof of all people, inclusion of the dispossessed and working across dimensions of development, certainly uh, economic, social and environmental, but also across humanitarian and peace building and prevention efforts. If the SDGs are so dramatically different then, and we can dream about such things, then the UN development system must also be so if it is to de deliver for the world at large and for LDCs. Last year, last week to the economic operational activity segment, the UN development system uh, group chair reported on the progress on the reform. The SG reported on how our effectiveness has improved by the UN coming together to work in emergency mode in the COVID socioeconomic response. We had a global socioeconomic response. 
uh, socioeconomic response plans formulated in over 100 uh, countries, repurposing of billions of dollars to be more agile and responsive, uh, and to advocate that the billions of dollars being uh, mobilized in fiscal stimulus be SDG aligned, that the recovery helps countries get onto a more just, green, equitable, digitally inclusive trajectory towards the SDGs. Our reports from last week have all of the data, which I don't have time to go to, but we can't uh, think only about COVID. The reform has given the UN and member states a whole set of new tools and capacities which are at your service and which you need to hold us to account for. The independent RC with capacities in the RCO, uh, specialized human rights and uh, peace and development capacities, CCAs, common country analyses that are no longer bureaucratic exercises, but should represent the leading intellectual contribution by the UN to development policy uh, uh, debate, drawing on the capacities from across the system new cooperation frameworks, which are our commitment with governments as to what the UN will deliver during a span of usually five years in a joined up way to help advance the SDGs. Swarnam, let me close by mentioning, you said this is not a national project, that we need global public goods and global cooperation. This we say at a time when there's very little faith in multilateralism and when there is little appetite for the kind of financing that's needed to actually help us achieve. We have an ongoing project now with the reform of the UN development system to enhance our credibility as we go beyond tools and policies and convene around the hard choices to be made between the immediate and the longer term, between the economic and everything else, and the practical between the national and the global at a time of great um, uh, strife and lack of global consensus. I hope we can continue this conversation and help land the LDC agenda in all of these instruments and capacities I've just outlined. Thank you again. Thank you, Rosemary. That was a very uh, uh, sobering reality check on where we are, where we need to go. And you also touched on the how um, in, um, in uh, you know, everything that we do henceforth, even coming out of the pandemic, how, pandemic, how do we align ourselves? Uh, with the Agenda 2030 that remains our sort of um, uh, uh, destination in the medium term. So thank you so much. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Joy um, Kategekwa, who is the strategic advisor uh, at the um, UNDP Regional Bureau for Africa. She was the founding head of the UNCTAD Regional Office uh, for Africa in Addis. Uh, she has worked for the WTO, leading the WTO African Group and as Oxfam International's Trade and Investment Advisor. So perhaps, uh, Joy, may I ask you to perhaps touch a little bit more on trade and investment issues, issues of demography, uh, innovation, uh, you know, as, as one possible uh, set of instruments uh, for an inclusive pathway coming out of this crisis uh, uh, in Africa, but also in other, other LDCs. So over to you, Joy. Thank you very much, Swamin. And as fate would have it, just when I'm being called, my home phone rings. So a little bit, you know, uh, shaken a bit, but thank you very much for the opportunity to engage. Thank you so much to Mansoor for the invitation. I've been requested really to talk about how we situate the pathways out of graduation from a trade perspective and how the African continent of free trade area sits in that space, especially for youth and for a recovery that's green and inclusive. So I'd like to make three points in seven minutes. The first one is that there's something about LDC-ness that is inextricably linked to a failed trade policy, to a structural impediment where trade does not perform its magic of creating a pathway to sustainable development. Because of that reality, there is therefore something, and this is the second generation of ideas, there's something in boosting intra-African trade that can be part of the solution. And then the third set of points will really be how then. So let's go back to the first point. When we talk about the criteria for an LDC, let's look at economic criteria. And you talk about economic and environmental, but let's look at economic in there. And looking at that, for me, there is a clear understanding that when countries break the shackles 
of a failed trade regime, they can go far. You're talking about issues like the share of agriculture in a country's economy, landlockedness. You're looking at issues around merchandise export concentration, the instability of exports of goods and services, instability in agricultural production. This tells you that as countries, as LDCs are locked in this space where the concentration of exports is low volume, low value, where exports cannot be diversified, where value addition is difficult, where the breadth and depth and the scope of the profile locks you in getting only at that bottom in securing that space that LDCs have gotten for themselves in the multilateral trading system, in the global trading system, which is to provide the raw materials, that the failure to crack that nut keeps you in an LDC space. This is why Ambassador Parks was telling us that indeed LDCs have failed to go beyond 1% of a composition of world merchandise exports. It's even less for world exports of commercial services. And so it tells you also that part, it tells you also that part then of the solution is how to help LDCs unlock that. Does this story change a little bit when we look at trade where it tends to work better for LDCs, which in this case is in the context of intra-African trade? I'd like to make the case that it does. Because even if intra-African trade is only about 16 to 18%, when you deconstruct that, you start to see something of the promise of where we want to go. You start to see light manufacturers as exports. You start to see a diversified portfolio. You start to see not exportation of tea, but packaged blended brands, not exportation of cocoa beans, but chocolate, not exportation of cotton, but beautiful African fabric, knitted and stitched into beautiful clothing. And so that is the journey we want to go to. You start to see 20% in a previous life, I used to work with Amkan, and we used to measure these issues, 20% of intra-African trade, more technology component. It tells you, that if we follow the path of something that's happening in intra-African trade, we can start to make uncomfortable that characteristic that makes LDCs LDCs for a trade reason. And so how then does the AFCFTA help us to get us there? The AFCFTA does that, the African Continent of Free Trade Area, by agreeing amongst African Union members who have agreed to be state parties, 36, 37 ratified the agreement so far, that in 90% of tariff lines, we shall go zero for zero. Now that's important because when we remember that average tariffs in intra-African trade range from about 8.5%, peaking around 9%, and that this is just what it is when it is applied, but it doesn't tell you the story when you start to actually produce and export, because when you get into that space, then you start to see the high tariffs, the peaks and the escalation. So tariff is a problem. And so the, the, the continental push to say, we shall bring down barriers to intra-African trade by bringing, going zero for zero, i.e. removing tariffs in 90% of our tariff lines, this is progress. And we're not stopping at goods, we're also going to services. And we're saying in critical services of an infrastructure nature, like transport, like telecom, like finance, you know, like tourism, like business services, we shall remove discriminatory barriers to trade amongst ourselves. That tells you that at the continental level, in the form of a treaty, the continent has agreed to start to dismantle, to disrupt that challenge which creates LDC-ness from a trade perspective. Now, we know that this is not the first trade agreement that African countries will be party to. Indeed, most of the 18% of intra-African trade that we talk about is thanks to FTAs in sub-regional contexts, your ECOWAS, your SADC, your ESC. Therefore, how can the AFCFTA be a different type of instrument? And there it has an important conversation around international support measures linked to LDCs. So I make the case, therefore, that in order for the AFCFTA to leave that space of treaty text and come down to women and men, come down to youth, we must do at least three things. One is to ensure that the preferential aspiration touches the ground in which trade is operating. So far at this point in time, many will celebrate the agreement, but it is not yet fully operational for purposes of preferential treatment. And so the reform agenda, the international support measures we talk about when we talk about LDCs and graduation must leave that theoretical space and come into this, the realm of how do we help LDCs? 
African LDCs to operationalize this instrument and utilize it. The last point I'd like to make, Swarman, because I see you're switching your microphone on, is that the agenda of how to do it is not rocket science, it's not new. It has been figured out at the African Union already in the action plan on boosting intra-African trade. It has the following components, trade policy, trade information, trade facilitation, trade finance, trade related infrastructure, trade productive capacities, factor market integration. We have to be serious about how we do trade capacity. We have to be serious about how we do productive capacity. We have to get very uncomfortable about theorizing and talking about these issues. We have to set ourselves a new standard as we look at LDC-5, that in fact, international support measures will not be about how many policies and how many papers we wrote. It will be about how did the share of exports rise and surpass that very unfortunate 1% mark. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joy, for that uh, very optimistic sort of a trade-led uh, uh, vision. Uh, for Africa's uh, recovery and revival. Uh, I, I, as a trade economist, I have my own biases on, on this topic as well. And so, uh, and, and, and the, the different facets of regional trade, the Africa across the continent uh, that you see as this uh, new source of dynamism to revive light manufacturing, go into higher valued processing and all that. I think that's a very, um, it, I mean, for a, 10 to 15 years, the whole WTO sort of center discussions have been kind of stagnant. With the arrival of Madame Angozi and uh, uh, you know the, the whole renewed interest on trade, I think there's a lot to be um, uh, unpacked here. So without further ado, let me go to Professor Stefan, Stefan Durkin, uh, a very distinguished professor of economic policy at Oxford, uh, also directs the Center for the Study of African Economies and um, is, is a, a policy advisor to the Foreign Secretary at the UK's FCTO. Uh, and importantly, uh, between 2011 and 2017, he was also the chief economist uh, um, of DFID. And obviously, uh, as an academic, as a policy advisor, has dealt with almost everything that we've talked about so far. So looking to you, Professor Durkin, for uh, the academic insights, but also the policy nudges and the direction that we need to go as we come out of the pandemic um, with special references to Africa and, and, and the least developed countries. So over to you, Professor Darkin. Well, thank you very much, Wani. And um, look, it's it's a hard act to follow all, um, all the previous speakers and um, kind of pick out for also Rosemary and Joy putting uh, very forcefully certain points across. And I'll try to um, do two things in the little time that I have is briefly you know, just reflect in terms of with a lens from inequality, what went wrong, what went right in the last year or two, and actually I'm trying to be constructive and say, you know, what are the things where we can start if we want to start thinking about getting out of the, um, out of the crisis? And um, so, so maybe quickly on, in terms of what went right, what went wrong, you know, it is too early and in, in, it's a typical way, you know, people have talked about a lot about data. It's so really hard and we see that even in rich economies with good data systems, we're beginning to get the excess mortality data, you know, when people said, look, all the things we were going to do is protection. We haven't, of course, seen them well emerging yet from developing countries. Where have they protected better than others? Of course, we see the GDP losses, but it's also on the poverty side. At the moment, most of our our gut feeling is that we've been set back several years, that poverty will be have increased dramatically. It's of course all still based on, based on a lot of modeling. The, the profiles of who coped best, who didn't, and so on, it will take a bit of time. But it's clear that you know, the best predictions we have is that you know, the, the, the inequality will have increased because we do seem that see that better off people could protect themselves, they were in white collar jobs, they could do all kinds of certain protection, and the poorest people actually will probably have uh, suffered relatively speaking more and, and will have to see where it all goes. But there's definitely a big data issue, a, a measurement issue to make sure that coming out of this crisis, we start measuring well and getting a good sense of what's happened. But, but even if we start thinking a bit about who has acted well or who didn't, you know, I, I, I was rereading a bit of some of the things I was writing 12 months ago, and this was before I moved back into the UK government, and, and my gut was I kind of confirmed of how difficult policymaking is at this moment. You know, this is 
a period of incredible uncertainty and um, I'm not giving any state secrets uh, away, but, you know, government departments are in turmoil. It's incredibly hard to actually plan beyond the next few days thinking what will happen. And at the time I wrote, you know, you want people to take clear actions, but you want to have an attitude of learning and correcting. And I think if, if we're seeing something happening, can I just say India, like, you know, you may be on the right path, but be careful not to declare victory because you don't know what's around the corner. And for LDCs, it's definitely still something there clear. But the one thing that we can be confident about that one of the big hindrances we had to respond well is that it wasn't just about having the means, the financial means, but also the mechanisms to act. And that's actually what I mainly want to emphasize in terms of when we go to the next year, can we start thinking more about it? And I want to focus briefly on three things here. You know, I think one amazing thing has been much better than I thought a year ago. You know, we all thought, you know, the poorest need to be protection. Let's hope social protection measures will work. There's actually been far better than I think any of us that have worked in this area could have thought. Virtually every country of the world has mobilized social protection systems, have tried to expand them, has tried to add cash to them, increase the, the, the turnouts and so on. You know, the database that the World Bank keeps on social protection systems they, they seem to now have 3,333 lines. And I know they started before the pandemic at about 700. So there's this massive increase of measures that have to do with social protection. But of course, what we're learning is that those who were not included to start with, it's incredibly hard to reach them now. Those that uh, systems that were very much paper-based were incredibly hard to increase quickly. And so that's an important thing. So there's an unequal access that actually people that were excluded to start with couldn't get included. So that's a mixed bag of success and failure. Where we definitely have failed is education. You know, we thought we would do something and I really worry. And why do I worry about that? Because that's the main mechanism of intergenerational inequality. And even if kids are going back to school, the learning deficits across the income distribution are going to be massive. The lower end would not have had the parents that were educated that could keep the kids going, and but the upper end could uh, you know, do homeschooling and whatever you could. So an exacerbation on the educational inequalities through learning is definitely happened. And the final one, some of you have already picked up, and I was um, you know, both pleased and not pleased to notice it, uh, and I'll mention a little bit more about it, but it's on the vaccine uh, a year ago, you know, it was very clear, you know, I am in Oxford, I know exactly the people who are developing the vaccine, you know, it was clear that manufacturing was going to be the problem. And the source of inequality was going to be volumes, not to do with price, but was going to be volumes. And of course, that's the source of inequality now is the volumes because you know, political economy will tell you is that there's no G7 country is going to give an awful lot away when they're under their own political pressures. Volume was the one that now will cause the inequalities. So three things we can do very quickly. So the things we can do is let's keep on now, whenever we have a window of opportunity, when the pandemic is not too harsh, places that are coming out of it, build social protection measures. Build them now because you'll need them again. And try to build them as much as you can with mobile systems. I think uh, the, um, Tijani was mentioning ICT. That's the main thing why we need them actually for, for leaving no one behind. To actually be able to do mobile payments, uh, the digital payments, and do it all based on cash. Let's, get, let's not dream of complicated systems. Cash-based social protection system by mobile things. In fact, working with actually a, a, a massive uh, tech company and with others, we seem to be ready to actually try out whether we can as quickly as we can in three countries, building on the success of Togo, who's done actually some clever things, actually building on some successes we've, we had in Bangladesh, where we managed during the crisis now to get actually cash transfers to people affected by floods five days before the floods uh, actually happened, because we used modeling to predict it. And we managed to actually achieve exactly what you want to do, cash transfers in time. In fact, before the crisis, the need is actually occurred and entirely based on both science and mobile systems. So we can do things and that's the window. The second one is quickly on vaccines. It's been mentioned and people believe that this is the moment for IPR, for international property, uh, the, the, the IPR, the, the, the property rights transfer and so on. 
I, I have unfortunately bad news that IP waving is not going to help us now. This is so complicated, whether we think of the mRNA vaccines or the Oxford vaccine that I know well, you cannot just, unless you really work with the manufacturers and with the developers, you can't get it transferred now. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. It's a good starting point. And I think Ngozi got it right. She's working very well in the WHO, uh, WTO on actually working. You know, this is the moment to actually get what we really is about tech transfers, getting the firms cooperating with us researchers to get a transfer into developing countries. And there's a couple of initiatives. And that's actually an interesting one that people shouldn't forget. You know, Oxford likes to take credit for having signed the contract with AZ, with AstraZeneca, that was actually at cost. And it's still, at the moment, 98% of the vaccines in least developing countries are the ones that the Oxford people had. And I can show you it's because the researchers said, we want to do it at cost that you can afford it actually to buy it now and COVAX can use it. But 12 months ago, we knew manufacturing was the problem. And one of the things that is written in the contract, I know very few people will have read the AstraZeneca contract, is that it said, but you'll have to have to work with serum. And AstraZeneca wasn't sure it wanted to do this, but you have to work with serum in India. And with all the problems now that they're not exporting, but that was the kind of thing. I also know that the Oxford team was calling around the world, where can we get anyone to produce it? But actually serum and a few facilities in, in South Africa and a few in Holland were actually able to do it. But this is the moment to actually push this further because the ambition should be not as on current uh, data by 2024 we'll have the world vaccinated, but we can do this by 2022. And it is about setting up manufacturing facilities in developing countries and pushing and forcing the manufacturers to move with and doing voluntary agreements in the places. That's not about IP waving because it's not going to help you. There's no manufacturer that just can do it with the recipe. It's actually might needs much more. Now, finally, education. Work now in thinking what your recovery plan is for education because you'll need to do the learning catch up. This is not about getting the kids back in school and thinking the school is open and everything will happen. It's about thinking about how you do the catch up of the learning, especially of the poorest. Because as, as I said earlier, this is where the intergenerational inequality will be transmitted. And that's the, the crisis we need to challenge, to tackle now. It's not just about money. Everybody says increase the money. Having all the SDRs recycled, if we don't have clear plans of how we're going to use it, we're going to waste that money as well. It's now thinking about carefully, what are we doing with it? So please don't just focus on the, on the volume of finance. And I know I can speak easily, working in a government department has got, just cut its, cut its budget by 30% on aid, but that's not why I'm saying it. Let's use what we have uh, very well and we'll do much better in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Durkin. Uh, that was uh, a very sharp, succinct sort of uh, pointers on uh, where to focus uh, going forward points on education and the learning crisis, um, very well taken on vaccines and the manufacturing capacities that can be ramped up uh, and social protection successes that can even be accelerated with the adoption of digital technologies. And the, the example from Bangladesh, uh, you know, getting cash into people's hands well before the crisis, that, that, that's, uh, that's the first time I heard it. So it's, uh, it's, it's great. And also a big fan of your book on doll disasters, which I've been using uh, to uh, raise awareness on how to prepare better. So thank you so much. Um, I think um, uh, we are, um, we have run out of time. Um, there are a few questions uh, in the chat box, but what I'm gonna do is possibly maybe give a 30 second uh, opportunity for any of the panelists uh, who want to uh, have the final say, beginning with the ambassadors, maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, do that. I know Rosemary and other panelists have uh, so might have to leave at, at, at three. Uh, I won't aim to uh, summarize the rich discussions, but let me also just in closing, uh, before I give the 30 second uh, slot to all the panelists uh, who are still um, with us um, and with a few thoughts, I think uh, Professor Durkin mentioned this, uh, the, the, the style of governance where you, know, you are learning, course correcting, constantly uh, not going for uh, you know premature victory declarations that's that's very much one of the lessons uh, also coming from our work in the asia pacific this integrated adaptive you know open transparent uh, sort of governance styles and and where you place greater trust in scientific expertise 
and and authority also is uh, you know has has mattered it has saved lives in some east asian countries um, and you contrast that with countries where governance has been weaker uh, we're more autocratic tendencies i think uh, that that that's something to be uh, really looked into uh, going forward on social protection i think standing architectures uh, sort of pre existing social protection architectures have tended to work better than ad hoc responses it is correct and world bank did this amazing study uh, at the end of uh, well in january i think a few months ago where they documented uh, 1400 social protection measures cumulatively accounting for almost a trillion dollars but the big takeaway from there was many of these cash transfer schemes lasted just 3 months 3.3 months on average and the average handout uh, in the low income countries was just $6 per person right so that sort of underscored the point that if you have something ad hoc responses hit the wall pretty fast i mean you run, run out of money the delivery mechanisms uh, have their own constraints so even if at a modest level of development you need to invest in these standing architectures and i guess finally you know what experiences from rwanda vietnam and contrasted with some of the rich countries that did very well in the health security index that johns hopkins produced just before the pandemic is this distinction between capacities and capabilities right so you may have the world's best hospitals the most well trained health personnel uh, if you look at the covid deaths per capita and all that not a, very little of that was deployed into saving lives and this is where the primary healthcare systems and other 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 investments that one can make at even low levels of development which vietnam did which rwanda did and you know contrasted with other peer countries but also richer countries mm-hmm. i think there was sharp contrast uh, that came uh, along so uh, let me end uh, with by giving the floor to uh, perhaps let's start with uh, ambassador ligoya if you are still here i'd give you 30 seconds if you want to say something uh, in closing thank you very much uh, sanim and uh, i have uh... listened very carefully to to all the uh uh colleagues who who have spoken i uh, i will say just briefly two or three points the first one is we have to get away from aid dependency uh the the last speaker said i mean it's not only money that that matters and that's how uh, we include things uh, such as governance uh, which is very crucial and uh, the the theme of uh, productive capacity if we increase the capacities within the ldcs to produce uh, i think this will reduce the aid dependency and we have talked about uh, you know uh, domestic uh, revenue finding ways of uh, through tax or otherwise uh increasing so uh we should uh, have this uh program of action uh stressing on the need for ldcs themselves to take measures within their own countries that would uh, uh help uh, reduce inequalities on on social yes on social protection uh, we are glad that we are hearing of the possibility of uh, having a global fund for social protection this is probably what we need but uh, i take note of all the comments that uh, uh, you have uh, made thank you thank you uh, ambassador mohammad bande if you'd like to take 30 seconds for your closing thoughts if he's not there let me go to hello ah oh, you're yeah, there thank you. okay. yeah no, no thank you very much indeed i think uh, this is a very important conversation relating to a very uh, important matter uh, certainly inequality does affect everything we do and any effort both nationally regionally and globally to begin the real work of making inequality uh, history in many in many areas of reduction is is something that we i think we should focus on and i think the ideas given in relation to the sub region of africa and the ldcs i think uh, are good and practical ones thank you thank you very much ambassador so joy um, thank you very much indeed just to reiterate that trade is part of the solution uh building capacity for utilizing opportunities in trade agreements is a critical part of it 
for African LDCs, the AFCFTA is a gateway in order for it to have its full impact, we have to transition from thinking about international, you know, international support measures as something of a, of a construct that is not landing in the place of productive capacities for exports. So that is really the point. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, Professor Durkan, would you like to come in again or? Yes, well, just say one point and maybe following up on the last point is that, you know, trades will be one of these things. We need to get these economies to grow quickly as well. And I didn't want to emphasize too much in my intervention, but, you know, let's not again just hide behind good themes as green growth or, or something there, but actually be really carefully thinking how we're going to use the resources, because again, you know, it's the, the nature and the pattern of growth that will in the end deliver the inclusivity uh, and will in the end uh, keep and the equality. For the Thank fifth you. United Nations Conference. Thank you so much. On the list. And, um, Mansoor, would you want to come in at the end and maybe close the event? Uh, thank you, Joe. You've been doing a great job, Swane, and I, I would definitely not attempt to, to provide any summary. I think this has been a um, great um, set of exchange, uh, very enlightening. And we do look forward to, um, you know, continue this conversation. Really wanted to seize the opportunity to thank um, your excellencies, uh, Ambassador Ligoya and Ambassador uh, Mohamed Bande from, from Nigeria. Um, Professor Derkan, Joy, and Rosemary, and, and all the participants, and of course, you, Swanem, for the outstanding moderation role. So, so we really see this as an ongoing conversation, as has been rightly pointed out by other panelists. What we need now is to reflect how concretely we transition from this conversation to a proposition that can inform the next program of action. That's where we can add value. And that's where I see this as an ongoing conversation where we really need to join forces, come up with bold and concrete proposals to really kind of change course. And that's what is needed at this stage. You know, this is really a call to action. We need to walk the talk. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And with that, I will close it. And thanks again also to Christian and Samantha and everybody uh, at UNDP who put this together. And uh, the session has been recorded. It but there, there are many rich insights and nuggets there. I think one can even transcribe um, uh, uh, this session into a, a brief uh, policy uh, mem uh, note of some kind. I think that would be a good uh, knowledge product as well. But the recorded uh, video can obviously be shared uh, to uh, audiences that were not able to uh, participate today. Again, profound gratitude to everyone uh, who contributed their time and insights uh, to this important topic. Thank you so much. And with this, we close the event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.